I skimmed the chapter and uh, there's really quite a few things that are crammed in there, even though it's short, there's many things. Um, so I think uh, one thing you may want to take out of it is uh, optimization, because um, it talks about optimization and also Jacobians and Hessians, because those things come all over machine learning. Uh, does that sound good? Okay, so I'll talk about uh, the first optimization. Uh, does everybody know why we should care about optimization? In case you don't, when you're training neural network, you usually have uh, some kind of loss function. So you have neural network, uh, it takes, has some parameters, it takes x and it predicts a y. And then when you're training neural network, you're trying to minimize some kind of loss of theta. Uh, arc, arc min over theta. So you're basically creating some kind of loss so that when you minimize this loss, uh, your neural network predicts uh, your data set correctly. So everything in neural network is about minimizing things. So it's a good idea to understand how minimization works. And I'll go over a simple one-dimensional minimization, the gradient descent, then I'll go over using Newton's method, and yes, then... I'm gonna check across the thing, sorry. I'm sorry for, yeah, for bothering you. Yeah. yeah, and then you'll see that this form of Newton's method in 1D example is actually the same as the more general Newton method for which you need the matrices and linear algebra. So here's a simple example. We have f of x equals uh, x minus a squared. So how do you minimize it using gradient descent? So you take the derivative, the derivative of this written as f prime of x is uh, 2 x minus a. Uh, so in order to do gradient descent, you first start with some initial get. Let's say x0 uh, equals uh, 4. And uh, when training neural networks, actually, this initial value can be quite important. So some of the advancements in the last uh, year, uh, there is a paper by Tim Salomons and Dirk Kingma called uh, Data Dependent in Initialization. So picking this initial point can actually be quite important. You pick a back point, you uh, do not do very well. So, you start with this, and then gradient descent proceeds by the following formula recursively. So you, you suppose you have some x of i, and then you say x of i plus 1 is equal to x, x of i minus some learning rate times f prime. of x of i. Does it make sense? This is how you do gradient descent. So if we start with this, I'll just do one iteration. So uh, so I'm going to need I'll need uh, like the derivative of x of uh, zero. That's uh, two times uh, x zero minus a. Let's say a is equal to two. Like in that graph you see, it's two, two. Uh, and then x0 is 4, so it's 2 times uh, 4 minus 2 times 2 equals 4. So that's, uh, that's the slope uh, at that point. And uh, so now I'm saying x of 1 is equal to x of 0 minus, let's say, learning rate. This uh, thing is called the learning rate. Let's say 0 0.9 times 4 is equal to. 4 minus 0 0.9 times 4, and that's uh, 4 times that's 0 0.12. So essentially, when I'm doing gradient descent, x is my parameter vector. So I started where it's equal to 4, and then I jumped where it's equal to 0 0.4. So I got a little bit and my uh, loss function decreased, so I got a little improvement. So, and that's the graph that you see. 
here's a nice mathematical visualization, and here is a here's what it looks like. I started by four, and then I went to zero point four, so I'm essentially going backwards and forwards. And uh, so this is learning rate nine, and uh, one property of gradient descent is it can be unstable, meaning if you pick the wrong learning rate, your learning can diverge. So in this case, let's try learning rate 1.1, and you see it, that's what happens. So it just, it just diverges, and then it goes larger and larger. Uh, and what happens if I pick a very small learning rate? Uh, well, it just uh, goes very slowly. That's 100 iterations. It just goes very slowly. And one thing that you can notice here, which is also true in uh, neural networks, is you want to make your learning rate as large as possible uh, until you diverge. Meaning, the larger you make it, the, the faster the conversion happens, but at some point you don't, don't converge anymore, and essentially you want to be like at this edge of stability. So in this case, uh, basically you want to be as close to one as possible. So there is some analytic way to derive the optimal learning rate, but the point is you want to make it large while it's still converging. Can anybody see a faster way to minimize this function? Plug in two. Right, right. So <laughs> the faster way to minimize this function is to use linear algebra. And when you use linear algebra, I'll, uh, I'll derive it more generally. So in this case, you can just see uh, you plug in two, uh, it's uh, minimized. But more generally, you minimize it by saying, by solving this. By solving this system, f of x is equal to 0. Uh, so does it make sense why this is equivalent to minimizing the function? So you have, uh, you have some function. And then this uh, derivative is essentially the slope. So at, at point four, we calculated the slope was equal to four. And at this point, slope is equal to zero. So essentially, a more general way to minimizing functions is uh, to take the derivative, set it to zero, and just solve that equation. You mean uh, right. So and that's what people typically assume. They just assume everything is nice, even though it isn't, and then they just solve this equation. Um, so let me go over the simple example because the result will also be more general. So we want to solve, solve where uh, <coughs> we know the following f of x is equal to 2x minus 2. And uh, another concept I'll introduce is the second derivative. So second derivative, you take the derivative and you differentiate it again. So here, second derivative of x is equal to uh, 2. So it's basically a constant. And the second derivative, uh, so here, notice that um, the first derivative, it's the slope. It measures how fast the function is changing. Similarly, the second derivative is the slope of the derivative. So it measures how fast the slope is changing. So it uh, essentially is a measure of curvature of a function. So in this case, we can rewrite, let's say, let me derive Newton method uh, backwards. So we know this is equal to 2. And then we can derive it x plus 1 equals uh, x of i plus x of i minus 2. which is equal to x of i plus the derivative of x multiplied by, uh, let me use a different letter, let's uh, call it h of x, because in a higher dimensional case, the equivalent is a Hessian, but here h is the same as this double prime of f. And uh, we can write it as follows.
What's the logic behind this? Yeah. So <laughs> basically, I knew the answer, and I just rewrote it in terms of a Newton method. But if you derive it using the data series expansion, you might be able to show why your h of h inverse of x, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the reason. Yeah. So that's the reason. Uh, and here is just a simple example to show that these two are equivalent. So essentially, if you take this formula and apply it, you will get the result x of i plus 1 equals 2. So essentially, x of, x of i is cancel out. So in Newton's method, regardless where you start, your step will always jump to the minimum. Um, so and this is an important formula to remember because so in one dimensional case, it looks like this. In multi-dimensional case, it looks like uh, uh, essentially the same, but we, we will use a capital letter. So if you look at uh, Google Wikipedia Newton method, you'll see this formula, which is pretty similar to what you're seeing here, except um, in higher dimensional case, H can be a matrix. So this negative one is actually a matrix inverse and this uh, may be a vector. So here it's a scalar multiplication, here it's a matrix vector multiplication. So this was example for one dimensional. <coughs> so this is a uh, right one dimensional case. So now let's talk about two dimensional communication. So this is all, this is all Tang. He's gonna talk about um, saddle points and uh, uh, extrema. So I'll just tie this into that. So now, this is a 1D case. Now suppose you're minimizing f of x1, x2 is equal to x1 <coughs> squared plus x2 squared. Uh, can anybody see how to write this in matrix form? So, um, a useful tool. So all of, say what? Yeah. Uh, right, so you can say it's x1, x2 times x1, x2. <coughs> uh, but more generally, you wanna, uh, there's a more general form. And if you do more general, for instance, suppose you have a 2x1 plus x2 squared. So you can write that as x1, x2 times 2, 0, 0, 1, x1, x2. So let me uh, talk a bit about Jacobians and Hessians. Uh, so earlier I talked about the gradient. Uh, Jacobian is a multi-dimensional generalization of the gradient. It's basically gradient in uh, multi-dimensions. And here, let me show you how, uh, what the Jacobian would look like in here. Uh, so, here you have a function of two variables and it has a, a single output. So more generally, you can look at uh, the Wikipedia for definition, but Jacobian is a matrix where uh, the number of rows is the number of outputs, outputs, and this is number of inputs. inputs. In this case, uh, my function has two outputs, oh, sorry, one output and two inputs. So the Jacobian looks like this. There's like two, and this is one. And uh, more specifically, the Jacobian, it will be the derivative of f with respect to x1, and the derivative of f with respect to x2. So it will be this matrix. And to find this matrix, you just, uh, differentiate this expression. So you take this one, differentiate with respect to x1. So this one is uh, 2x1, 2x1. This one is, um, well, it doesn't depend on uh, x1, so it's zero. So <coughs> the first one is just this. And uh, now you differentiate with respect to this one, it's uh, 2x2. Wow, this check. One x2. Oh, sorry, I'm, I was looking at the wrong one. So let's do this, it's uh, four, four x one plus two x two. Make sense? Okay, so now 
how does gradient descent work? So gradient descent works in exactly the same way. You have a vector, uh, so except that uh, instead of a scalar, you have a vector. So you would say x0 is equal, for instance, 0 and 0. And then you just, uh, this uh, uh, derivative here is now a Jacobian, which is a, uh, has two elements. So when you're applying gradient descent, you're just adding this value to that value. So let me show. Uh, well, it is f of x gradient. Oh, okay. Yeah, so because there's two because there's two variables. Mm -hmm. There's two variables, so you have to modify both variables. Okay. Okay. So this thing is added to the first variable. This thing is added to the second variable. So let me show you a pretty picture. So that's the the function you saw above, and this is uh, what happens if I apply gradient descent. So, uh, and again learning rate, I can play with the learning rates, and uh, you see if the learning rate is too high, the gradient descent just explodes. If it's uh, too small, too low, it just takes forever. And uh, here it just oscillates between these two values. Earlier, I showed uh, the formula for the Newton method, is x of i plus 1 is equal to x of i minus um, gradient at point x of i times the x of i. So what is the Hessian? So earlier case you saw you just differentiate it twice. Uh, in this case, uh, same thing. You, the Hessian in this case you differentiate the Jacobian with respect to the first variable, and that will be the first row of the Hessian, and then you differentiate the Jacobian with respect to the second variable, and that will be the second uh, row of the Hessian. So let's do this. So Hessian, so the first row I differentiate with respect, with respect to x1, it will be uh, four, and then the second value is zero because it doesn't de depend on x1. And the second row will be like this. So for the, the intuition for the Hessian is that the diagonal is a measure of the curvature, or mm -hmm. I uh, guess the whole thing is a measure of the curvature in, in whatever dimensional space you're looking at. For well, the Hessian, you can look at this in this matrix form. So notice here that this value here is just uh, double of this this thing here. That's because of the squares behind the terms. Uh, right, right, because of the squares. So essentially, when you have uh, an expression like this, you don't have any cross terms. You don't have any terms where x1 and x2 appears. The values in front of the square terms are also are proportional to the values in the Hessian. So it has the same intuition as in in 1D case. So this value, it's value from the diagonal, and the higher it is the higher the curvature. Uh, quick question. Mm -hmm. So the, the Hessian is always a square matrix? Like it's always a square diagonal matrix? Mm -hmm. no, not, not always diagonal. Not always diagonal, but it's always a square matrix. Yeah. Um, and um, the Jacobian is always, the Jacobian is always in that form, right? Like the Jacobian yep. never will go into this, like, it's just Yeah, the Jaco for neural networks, um, your output, is usually your cost is always a scalar, yeah. so Jacobian <laughs> is always um, like right. Yeah, okay. In more general case, if you have several outputs, the Jacobian becomes a matrix. Yes. Okay. But then the Hessian is like this three-dimensional tensor, and everything becomes very complicated. Okay. However, if you stay in this uh, single output case, you you can still have matrices. So right. the non-diagonal Hessian is when you have cross terms. Yes. So, as an example, uh, if you have 2x squared plus 2y squared plus xy, you can write that as, uh, let's say, xy times uh, 2, 2, 1. So, for simplicity, let me write it as 
one half x y plus one half y x. So you can write that as this x y. So that's uh, an equivalent way of writing this formula, and the Hessian is proportional to this. But a very useful fact of linear algebra is if you have a matrix which is symmetric and real, um, you can rotate things. So it's essentially an orthogonal transformation away from uh, being diagonal. In other words, if you, if you start and you have, for instance, contours are like this, then your Hessian is diagonal. But suppose your axis, if you have cross terms, your thing may look like this, uh, but you could still rotate it and uh, it will be axis aligned. So the side effect is this, you can always, without loss of generality, you can assume Hessian is diagonal. And that just simplifies things. Yeah. Um, my question was just like a context effect. So we're using the Hessian to find the global minimum, right? Uh, for the quadratic, uh, we can find the global minimum, yeah. And what advantage does the Hessian give us in gradient descent on like the multi-level case? So it's the same as the advantage in a single variate case. So in a single variate case, you saw that in Newton method just took a single step and uh, gradient descent took forever. So it's the same thing in multivariate case. Oh, actually I can, I can show you what it looks like if you have cross terms. Uh, so let's, let me add x1, x2. So essentially it skews it, but if you look at from the top, it's still an ellipse, it's just at a different, different angle. So without loss of generality, you can just assume Hessian is diagonal in some coordinate system. If it's uh, diagonal to start with, it's, uh, things are aligned in the regular coordinate system, but if not, then it's uh, diagonal, but you may need to rotate, uh, change your variables. Um, one thing that uh, was brought up in the book is condition number. So condition number means many different things, but in this case of optimization, it uh, essentially something that tells you how badly gradient descent will do. So a condition number in the book was defined as the ratio of the largest eigenvalue by the smallest eigenvalue, uh, eigenvalue of the Hessian. In case when the Hessian is diagonal, the eigenvalues are just the entries. So in the case of 2D, the condition number is the ratio of the largest uh, number divided by ratio of one number by the other number, because there's only two numbers. Um, and it's generally considered that bad condition number, large condition number is bad. And to give you intuition why it's bad, so here's what's gradient descent in uh, when it was just uh, two x1 plus x2, but now, Let's say I am trying to minimize 10 x1 squared plus x2 squared. And you see gradient descent. I can increase number of iterations. So gradient descent is taking forever. Uh, does it make sense why it's doing so badly? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of hard to see it in 2D, 3D, 2D. while when I was reading the chapter at home to figure out it was climbing down the wall but not uh... yeah so essentially you see this function it kind of looks like the strobe and uh, gradient descent it would be kind of like this ball that's just rolling back and forward so if you have large condition number gradient descent will take forever uh, now what happens if we apply Newton method yeah Uh, right, so the condition number, sorry, I'm going to move over there. Uh, so what happens if you have these contours like this? Uh, your minimum is here, but 
but uh, the gradient is actually pointing that way. So basically the more squeezed it is, the further away uh, the gradient will be. And then when you apply Newton's method, uh, your Newton's method will actually make it point to the maximum. If you apply Newton's method, so here's an example, uh, I'm taking the gradient and uh, here I, you see I'm multiplying by the inverse of this matrix, by the gradient, and now it goes directly to the, uh, to the minimum. Is aligned, then yes. So, as an example, is the variables can be on the same scale, but this thing is like diagonal, like this. If you normalize the two variables, uh, I mean they're already on the same scale. Normalizing will not do anything. But wait, if I just scale one variable mm -hmm. and calculate the result, and I get to you know, I get to the point, mm -hmm. and I just then. Uh, you could, but there are cases when it will not help. And as an example of where it will not help, take this function uh, x squared plus y squared uh, minus maybe a one half xy, maybe plus. So when you're introducing correlations, you can have a function with the variables are completely symmetric, they're on the same scale, but the gradient descent will still do very badly. Uh, I mean, I can try to plug in something quickly into this. So this is gradient descent and it just goes directly. Uh, so now, let me try one, two, that's still fine. Yeah, so the point is, if you add these cross terms, you can continue having the variable symmetric, but uh, the variables can be correlated. So this condition in number tells oh. you how, how skewed the ellipses are? Yeah, exactly. So you ideally would want the, the circle you showed before? Uh, yes. Yeah, and I think I found uh, an example I cared about. Yeah. So here's an example. This is the this is the formula x uh, one squared plus x two squared plus something that's almost two x one times x two and this function these are the contours so it's still very the contours the gradient descent still does very badly but the variables are completely symmetric you cannot scale one variable to make this thing better so what's the solution the solution uh, Newton's method. Intuitively, what does Newton method do? I mean, gradient descent points into the steepest descent, mm -hmm. and you're saying that's not the case. Right. Intuitively, Newton method. So intuitively, Newton method uh, changes the coordinate system so that everything is a perfect circle. So in the example I had before, where I had uh, uh, x uh, two x squared plus uh, x one squared plus x two squared. When, I, when you look at the Hessian, the Hessian is something like 2, 1, and then when you invert it, it's like 1 half, uh, 1. So essentially when you multiply your gradient by, the, by this matrix, it will scale, it will say, do not go so much on this uh, coordinate. And then in the case of this matrix, the Hessian will be something like uh, 1, uh, 1 quarter, 1 quarter, 1. Uh, and then Newton method is equivalent. So when you invert it, an in inverse of a matrix, you can, it's the same as rotating those ellipses to be axis aligned, rescaling it, and then rotating it back. We kind of assumed here the functions were um, squared. Uh, I mean, square, mm -hmm. yeah. But the highest term was to the power two, right? Mm -hmm. um, does this still hold for higher 
for more complex functions. Great, so here we dealt with square functions and uh, the thing with square functions, if you use a learning read of one, so let me plug it in, uh, you converge in one step, theoretically. Maybe not, huh? Okay, there we go, I was off by two, sorry. Uh, so in a square function, a Newton step always uh, converges directly to the minimum. If you have higher order terms, it doesn't. Here is a simple example. You're trying to uh, solve, for instance, cosine this cosine of x, and then I start at some point, and uh, I'm applying Newton step. So you can see it can take several steps for cosine, and uh, this is actually a non-convex function. So you can see it can actually jump out and go to some other minimum. So in a function which is not a quadratic function, Newton method doesn't have to converge or it can take a long time, but it's still usually better than gradient descent. So one thing that was in the slides, but I think I have prettier pictures, was the kind of uh, points. So you can have a minimum, so it looks like this, <coughs> or you could have a maximum and it looks like this, and the third one, you could have a saddle point looks like this. And the saddle point uh, are actually kind of annoying because they are not a minimum but uh, they are still flat. So notice that uh, one way to minimize you can solve for the uh, derivative of x equal to zero. So essentially you're looking for the flat spots in the function and uh, when you have a saddle point it's a flat spot. So there's been some papers recently uh, trying to figure out how to avoid saddle points. And actually saddle points, they affect Newton method much worse than uh, gradient descent. So Newton method in this case, it would just jump directly to this point. And then the gradient descent would actually uh, kind of escape it. And uh, one uh, interesting- Can you say it one more time? I'm sorry, I didn't move everything fast enough to get, get it just uh, where it's gonna move right away? Ah, yeah, so uh, Newton's method, it's uh, in this case, it will go directly to the saddle point. So it'll directly find this flat spot, but it is not the minimum, and so it's not the point that you actually care about. And uh, one curious property from math is if you do contour plot, uh, the saddle point always correspond to the points where the contours cross. So here is more another pretty picture. So it's a non-convex function, and uh, here's a plot. So you can see uh, there are several special points. These ones corresponding to circles are uh, minima and maxima, and then there's, so there's one, two, three, four, five, five extreme points, and there is uh, one, two, three, four, four saddle points. And the saddle points are the things that you want to avoid. Uh, maxima are also the things you want to avoid, but it just happens that uh, uh, even though they're flat points, they're not stable. So if you start Newton's method, Newton's method will not converge to that point. It will go somewhere else. So in real life examples, how often do you uh, see saddle points? Um, uh, it's a it's a kind of a controversial topic because it's clear when you're looking at this uh, 2D example it's clear that you have a saddle point when you have a uh, million variables people are still arguing if the saddle points are there or not. Yeah, so there are several papers which talk about escaping saddle points. Some people try to add noise, they try to vary the learning rate, so there's various <laughs> techniques. In my opinion, we don't have any like very strong evidence that they exist, but uh, it's still useful to know about because a lot of papers talk about them. So a saddle point is kind of like your 
it's a yeah it's a flat it's a flat area uh, in your loss function which is not a minimum but if you're doing reinforcement learning with like lots of minimum to revenge then it isn't the entire like most of the game at that point or a flat area i mean uh, you could have uh, yeah so we definitely have flat areas meaning plateaus so you could have something like you're minimizing and it's a common thing you just you're just stuck like this and then you're here and then you, something like this happens so we definitely observe this uh, but we don't know is it saddle points or is it just some flat area in the function in higher dimensions do, does the saddle need to exist in all the dimensions or just some of them so let's see so I guess the question what's the definition of saddle point so um, I guess saddle point is where you have some some curvature is going up and some curvature is going down. So you may have like something like this, and then in the other dimension you have this. So maybe the second derivative is so the, all those derivatives, uh, first derivatives are zero, but the second derivative is like n minus one variable is positive and one variable. Right. Right, so a saddle point is where you have some, if you look at the Hessian, you have some entries which are like positive, like two, three, and then there's like a negative one in there somewhere. I guess that would be a saddle point. In a, in a really huge dimensional space, so what is the possibility that you're actually going to have a true local minimum? I mean, there's always going to be one direction where odds are something can fly out of it. Um, plus, I mean, deep learning, we don't really care about strict convergence, right? We're still going to be talking about what we want, until it stops. So it really mathematically has to do a convergence, yeah. right? Yeah, so there are some papers which uh, say they take some simplified model of neural networks and then they show that all local minima have the same cost. So you really just care about getting the local minima. Uh, but it's useful to know about because people keep writing papers about them. So it's good to know what they're talking about. So I'll wrap up <laughs> this part, optimization, and talk a little about numerics. The most important thing to know about underflow and oh, you have a question? There's a bit of a discussion of the optimal value for the learning rate mm -hmm. uh, in the book. I kind of uh, oh really? What does it say? They do some maximum that's gradient times transpose of the gradient of the earthquake gradient times the Hessian times the Hessian. Well. One way to get the optimal uh, step size is um, so in my earlier examples you have uh, you have the gradient pointing somewhere so both points there you can um, expand this uh, you can look at this uh, loss function in one dimension in the direction of the gradient and uh, it'll look something like this and then you can use the curvature information from the Hessian to actually solve directly when you go in that direction, how big this value is supposed to be. And that's the formula which gives that value. So it's one dimensional, the optimal in one dimension, but you might keep the value, value and then go over. Right. And what happens is um, if you have a very ill conditioned problem, it, it may not help you that much. So I really, I really don't see many people using this, uh, this technique. People just tend to have a fixed learning rate they use. And then they also mention Lipschitz function. <coughs> uh -huh. It's seeing that early in, in the leading papers they keep talking about it. The Lipschitz uh, constant in this case, you have some function and it uh, changes. You want to see uh, the maximum possible rate of change. So one way if the function is differentiable and you have this derivative is never above two you can say that uh, the Lipschitz constant is also two so a simple way to think about this Lipschitz number is just uh, how fast the fastest that the function can change on the interval Lipschitz is a, it's a very good theoretical concept but I've never seen it being used in practical algorithms <coughs> or device and algorithm I mean 
the city boy is being talked about it, but I haven't seen it being used in any practical algorithms. I mean, the only way that the, the line plot that you were talking about earlier, if you look at the classic simplex paper that came about, that's where you use the line plot, and that's probably <coughs> the only algorithm in the world where you're actually finding the, the step size. Beyond that, you don't really need it. Well, in, in deep learning, the, there were a few recent papers where they mentioned that uh, they do gradient flipping. So when they do gradient flipping, they basically limit the slope of the function. And then they say that, that way the functions are big, like the ellipses for some function. Uh, uh, and uh, they do some other stuff so that it's kind of smooth. So they, they can do gradient the same method. Yeah, so basically, that, yeah, the, yeah, but that's very different from choosing the idea of step size, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it was a totally yeah. different size. Uh, but perhaps you have, you, you, so should, you should go. So people uh, usually make the slipshift assumption uh, in order to guarantee that something happens. So, for instance, you want to have an algorithm and you want to guarantee that it converges. So. Earlier I had an example where I adjusted the learning rate and it just went to infinity. So if you knew how fast your function changes, you could say the Lipschitz constant is bounded by that number and you could just pick learning rate small enough that things are nice. If it's not Lipschitz bounded, you may have a function and then you may have like a point where it's like, so actually a good example is square root. <coughs> square root like this. It is not Lipschitz bounded in this point here essentially at zero, the square root function, it's like vertical. So what happens is uh, you could, if you're minimizing it, you could get somewhere here and then you explode to infinity. Uh, so <coughs> essentially Lipschitz bounded says that the slope of the function is bounded and bad things don't happen. So let me say one thing about overflow and underflow. So there's three numbers which are connected to each other. Uh, there is zero, there is infinity, and there is an n. And what happens is uh, when some things go to zero, other things can go to infinity or to n. So in infinity, you have, for instance, x equals zero. You have something like one over x goes to zero, one over x goes to infinity, and then x over x goes to n. So those are valid uh, floating point values. You can have a variable and its values then. And people often start training neural networks and something and they get a bunch of NANs and they think it's a bug, but it's actually a natural, it's a correct result. What is, what is X, what, uh, X and N? This is just the one that's number one. Well, it's one if you simplify it algebraically, but if you have, maybe, maybe if you have X, uh, well, if you just take, uh, if you plug it in Python and try infinity over infinity, you should get an n. Uh, a equals mp in, mp over a, n. So it's actually a valid floating point number uh, that you get. And then uh, one over a is zero, and then one over zero uh, well, in Python, it's division by zero, but if you use NumPy, it, uh, it uses C underneath. So if it's NumPy, you get infinity. What is what NP in, by the way? What is what? NP dot in. NP dot in? It's uh, infinity. It's just, it's, just oh. a, it's just a NumPy convention. Yeah. 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 Because uh, Python, I don't think Python has it. Well, let me just uh, give a simple example. So. It's actually something people see in their real life training. But let me give a very simple example of how you can end up with these. So suppose you have a data set with just a single point. <coughs> you have x1 equals to uh, 1. And you want to predict for this value. You want to say uh, u of x1 should be uh, <coughs> let's see, prediction. probability of y equals 1 given uh, x1 
is equal to one. So essentially you, you have a single point which is equal to one and you have a binary classification task and you're just saying that the value you should predict one for this point. So you model your probability uh, like this. So this is uh, for binary prediction. Let's say we have a single parameter a, x, and then you normalize it because you want things to add up to one plus x minus a of x, and then probability of y equals to zero. <coughs> This uh, is basically one minus that, but if I write it out, it's negative a of x, x, a x plus x minus a x. Um, does it uh, make sense why I'm using this formula? So the bottom part is just I, I want to make sure that the result is always between zero and one. So it's normalizing things. The top part uh, is there because the probability has to be positive but when I'm minimizing some parameters I don't want to I want to do unconstrained minimization so essentially when I exponentiate something this uh, thing inside can be positive or negative but when I exponentiate it it becomes positive so this is a common transformation if you want to have uh, you, if you start with numbers that are either negative or positive you just exponentiate it you get a positive number so now uh, you have one parameter a and you want to adjust it so that when you plug in uh, x1 you want to get uh, probability 1. So you can see if you look at this you want, let's see, so let's say loss, uh, let's just say it's minus probability of y one, even x1 uh, squared. So that's my loss. And suppose I try to maximize this <coughs> loss. Can you see what uh, what will happen to my a? What's the value of a that will maximize this loss here? Infinity. Infinity. Yeah, so essentially uh, what happens here if I take some value a, so for instance let's say I take a equals to one. So I'll have, the value here will be e raised to 1 divided by <coughs> e1 plus uh, e minus 1. And uh, I can see what that is. And now suppose I, uh, if uh, e is 2, I get something like this. So that's my probability. You see it increased. So essentially, the larger I make a, the, the closer my probability is to 1. And essentially, there's no limit. And if I plug it into some gradient descent procedure, it's going to just go to infinity. So what will happen is that uh, my a, a will go to infinity. My loss will go to zero. And then suppose uh, my classifier at some point, it measures the probability of y equals to 1 given x divided by probability y equals to zero given x, that thing will go to an end. And it's, uh, it's a contrived example, but it's actually a common scenario in logistic regression. If you have a data set which can be per perfectly classified and you keep training it, that's what happens to you. Uh, eventually you just start getting NANDs. And uh, can anybody see what, what's an easier way to fix this problem in this case? There's a very simple trick that just fixes everything. Subtract the sum of the maximum. Subtract the what? Um, the point of the book, subtract the maximum. Um, so, yeah, but that's a trick, but it's a trick for a different problem. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Smoothing. Uh, Moving. Mm, no, no, you say it can't be more than the same number. Um, yeah, yeah. So that that would do it, but it's kind of uh, annoying to implement. So the trick is 
you just minimizing instead of minimizing this loss, you just add uh, plus a squared. You just add a little term. And now a cannot go to infinity because as a uh, goes larger, eventually this part becomes very large. And essentially, that's, uh, that's the one big reason why regularization is important. So in neural networks, you often see people add the regularizing term. Uh, it helps with numerical stability. It helps prevent situations like this. What you've written is very similar to what he said, which is rebounding A. That's a Lagrangian for what he said. It's you putting mm -hmm. a limit on the, on the magnitude of A, right? Which mm -hmm. is what he, what he said. That's what uh, he's saying in that. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a practical way of bounding A. Are there questions? Yeah. Uh, does regularization make the assumption of some kind of a prior? Um, so there are several ways to come up with regularization. So here I just added this, like heuristically I looked at it and I said, what can I do to prevent that? Uh, I added a squared. So there is the motivation from numerical stability. There's also Bayesian people which uh, minimize uh, log likelihood. And if you minimize a certain kind of uh, Bayesian form, you essentially get uh, the squared term, but it comes from a different motivation. So often, actually there's some papers which give connections. Uh, every time you have some kind of regularization term, you can reformulate it in Bayesian form by saying that you have a prior. So essentially, uh, if you're doing a Bayesian approach, you're trying to, so you have some space and you're trying to find you know, this true parameter. And you're saying, I believe it's somewhere around zero, but then maybe it's, it's far away from zero and you're saying that probability of this uh, theta is distributed as normal or a Gaussian distribution. So if you make this assumption and then you plug it into Bayesian approach, you essentially get end up with a square penalty. Is there ever a risk that you, um, when you're adding a regularization term like this, that you're adding uh, bias that uh, ultimately you're, you're kind of off in what this reactor is going to do? Uh, yeah. Essentially, the bigger, if you think about it, if you just add a very large predictor, it will just ignore the data. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you are adding bias. Um, but sometimes there is no way around it. If you don't add this bias, then uh, your, your learning doesn't happen. There's a bit of uh, discussion about constraint optimization with uh, some Lagrange multipliers and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Do, do you see appli many applications of those or uh, it's just an interesting side note to the paper. Yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, that whole area is a very rich, there's like whole books written on it, and it was just condensed into two pages. That's why I didn't go into it. Uh, there are applications to it sometimes. In, inside deep learning? Uh, so I actually had an application uh, application for it recently. So here's an application I saw recently. Uh, so uh, last week I talked about whitening. You want to predict, so you have some activations, and you want to predict, uh, say for instance, A3, you want to predict it based on all the other activations. So essentially you want to form a predictor where you're saying uh, uh, A3 is equal to phi1 A1 plus phi2 A2 plus zero times A3, because if that wasn't zero, you would, uh, it would be too easy, plus phi 4 A4. Um, and you're trying to uh, optimize this uh, components. If you were to optimize all of them simultaneously, you could write it as uh, you have some matrix <laughs> phi times A minus A. Uh, so that's your prediction. And uh, you want to maximize, you want to optimize A Let's say you want to say loss and norm. So you want to minimize this thing. Subject to, you want to ensure that the diagonal terms like phi one are zero. So you do subject to phi of i i equals to zero for all i. And that's a constrained minimization problem. 
and I had to do this KKT Lagrangian puzzle. So sometimes it comes up, but not very often. Before we jump into information theory, we'll just power through the slides for this chapter, just in case something was missed in this discussion. So, uh, this is something that happens sometimes. You just have overflow or underflow. Does it make sense? Well, it's when you, uh, if you put too large of a number in there, it will just, uh, it'll go to infinity. Okay. So, and all infinities are the same. So let's uh, try an example. Uh, so we have x, let's see, what should I put in here, 100? So that's still fine, 200. So 300? No, okay, 1,000. Okay, now it's overflow. And the thing about overflow is that it's infinity and all infinities are the same. So essentially you lost information. <coughs> and underflow, I do this and I get zero. And it's exact zero, so all zeros are the same. So I also lost information. Condition number, I guess I covered that. It's the ratio of eigenvalues. Uh, so gradient descent. This just shows that uh, when you do gradient descent, you're looking for this flat area. Uh, if you're doing gradient descent on the green function, uh, you'll just continue going to infinity. Critical points, so I covered that and I, I think I had better pictures. <laughs> so this just shows the problems, theoretical problems with uh, optimization. I think in practice, if you have many variables, it it probably doesn't look like this. If you have many variables, there's always a direction you can escape. So local minima are not that bad. Curvature. So this is an example. Um, so this is actually an example where normalizing individual variable doesn't help. So the x1 and x2, they have the same scale, but because they're correlated, you still have this uh, this behavior of a path of convergence. And th this thing, which we didn't cover. <laughs> Should we talk about that? Yes, I see yes. We want to talk about it? <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> No, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's, it's kind of complicated. It's, what uh, problem is it trying to solve? It, it's trying to solve the problem of uh, you want to minimize uh, f of x subject to subject to uh, g of x is equal to zero, and then h of x is uh, less than. So you have uh, equality constraint and inequality constraints. So you have lambdas and alphas. So lambdas correspond to equality constraints and alpha correspond to inequality constraints. And uh, what happens is you can actually transform this uh, constraint problem into the problem you're seeing here. Well, there's lots of names and magnets. But the bottom line of a lot of optimization research that happened in the last century is if you have this constraint problem, you can add some variables and uh, get an unconstrained problem. And then you can just plug it into a regular optimizer and do gradient descent. This happens when you want to minimize <coughs> functions that keep some parent parameters constant, right? They built that's a hard result. Well, if you just want to keep some parameters constant, that's kind of easy. You just keep them constant, right? That, that's the gradient multiplier, right? Isn't that the, like, isn't that well, that's a special case of constraint optimization. So there may be a... Oh. The they aren't necessarily constant, they're running curves. So they change, but they change in the So, parameters. if you just keep some parameters constant, that's a very easy case of constraint optimization. You can just degrade in descent and just zero out the parameters that are constant. Yeah. But you may have very complicated constraints. Uh, so one example of complicated constraints, you are fitting a probability distribution and you want to make sure that probabilities add up to one. So that's your constraint. 
uh, and then you can get rid of that constraint by doing that trick. Actually, that's a, that's a nice example. So you're trying to, you have some T1, T2, T3, uh, and you want to make sure that they add up to uh, 1, and you want to make sure that P of i is uh, greater than 0. So these are your parameters, and these are your constraints. And uh, you can use this Lagrange approach to transform the problem, but also you can use this trick. You can use this trick where you introduce parameters theta, where you're saying uh, P of i equals uh, x plus theta. So now, thetas are unconstrained, and uh, because you're exponentiating, it's positive. And uh, your loss, you're essentially, uh, you're turning it into x plus theta of y divided by the sum of x plus theta of y. So if you, if you just do this transformation, p of i goes to this, then you can uh, do this uh, without any constraints, and it's still an equivalent problem. Or you can do this uh, Lagrange multiplier approach. By the way, here's a practical example of what it looks like when you have underflow. So I'm minimizing, and at some point I get to almost zero loss, and then it just then it just going, starts going in the opposite direction. And uh, that's what happens when you don't add enough regularization to your problem. But the downside, if you add regularization, it actually takes longer to, to get to this point. So it's a similar situation. Yeah. Um, for offline optimization, do you have any thoughts on like for preferences in terms of VFGS or like any of the other um, uh, optimization packages? Uh, well, it depends how uh, on dimensionality of your problem. So normally it's very hard to beat Adam. So Adam is like the, the go-to scenario. And uh, if you have few variables, then uh, <coughs> then you can do Newton method. If it's uh, like a thousand variables, you can do Newton method. If it's 100,000, you can do LBFGS. But if it's a millions, then you just do regular gradient descending. The Newton method, have you been working with the matrix on a thousand variables? Yep, I can invert uh, uh, MKL. You can invert uh, in 4,000 in maybe half a second. Okay. So let me let me see. Uh, just a matrix of ones, thousand by thousand, and then matrix two. Singular. Uh, does anybody remember how to do a random matrix in NumPy? I think you got random.normal. Random.normal? Like this? Uh, I think random.rand and. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, or okay. random.rand and yeah, then bracket 1000. Random.rand yeah. and 1000. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's no list yeah. at all. Okay. Oh, it's done. Uh, okay, a little longer, but still, I can do 2,000 in under a second. So basically, you can do 10,000 variables and still do algebraic matrix inverses on a on a laptop. Things have improved. Oh, I was just, we were just talking uh, when it makes yeah, sense to use Newton method. Ah. In the Newton method, you have to invert the Hessian explicitly. I see. I see. Uh, and there is this method I talked about from last time, KFAC, which is state of the art for large batch training. And they, they do inverses of uh, 10,000 by 10,000 every 100 iterations.
you say in the that underflow solves the solution with collective validation. Um, uh, for complete to just uh, just subtract the maximum of uh, one of the right? Uh, right. So that I guess that's a different problem. So that's a problem when you're adding a, a big number to a small number, maybe? Well, do you remember the context? Yes, I mean, this is how you solve overflow. Well, I guess some kind of overflow, right? If you're just... A number. Oh. But this is for soft maximum. Right. So, with overflow and lambda flow, uh, why don't we just use like huge num like huge number libraries instead of the usual flow? Oh, they're really slow. They're really slow. They're not supported by uh, GPUs. I mean, uh, I use Mathematica to verify my computations, and in Mathematica, you have unlimited precision, but I just have to make my problems a thousand times smaller for things to finish. And I, I mean, because the normal floating point numbers, they're they're really optimized like hardware does them directly. And also the problem with uh, overflow, if you have overflow in uh, float 32, you double your precision, you'll still get overflow. You know, a few steps later, you'll overflow uh, 128. So that's really a systemic problem. Have you, have you used or seen any use of uh, like linear algebra tensors like, uh, rather than matrices and cipher? Um, I mean, uh, if you have a vector of examples, so if you have, if your example is an image, it's a matrix. If you have a batch of images, it's a tensor of rank three. So, and usually when you put it through a neural network, you put it at rank three tensor, and then you do convolution, and the convolution is a rank four tensor. So, you usually have rank four tensors in the convolution networks. Uh, could you talk a little bit about like Uh, well, I got started, uh, I guess, seven years ago when I, I was at the startup and they decided, I started as machine learning in collaborative filtering and then they decided to go all in on social, to be a social network for runners. And then I found the only task which looked like it wasn't to do with social, to recognize the, the numbers on runners' bibs. So I started figuring out how to do OCR and that was kind of fun, so then when the startup imploded, I applied to Google and I said, I want to be on the OCR team. And then they said, we don't have space, I'm like, goodbye. And then six uh, months later, it's like, we have space on the OCR team, and then I went there. <laughs> and then uh, five years ago, it was still before neural networks at Google, but then four, four years ago, they started using neural networks, so I kind of just uh, got into this neural network stuff. Uh, and we said, I mean, I talked, my latest thing I was working on was this better optimization. So there's this method called KFAC, which is like Newton method, but it's uh, actually efficient enough to use on GPUs. And I just spent the last two months working on improving it. So I'll work, I'll probably be open sourcing it within the next month or so. Is that the training that we see working on TensorFlow? Yes, yes, that's the, <laughs> that's the things. I need to solve, yeah. I need to add some regularization to solve this. What's the difference between those two modules? Uh, well, one is the training loss, another is validation loss. When you do numerical algorithms, you have to, you basically have to, whenever you make the smallest change, you have to run training again, because you add like a constant or like change a sign somewhere, you will never find it. You just have to go line by line and recheck everything. So the lesson is if you're doing numerical algorithms, you have to commit and rerun all your graphs, make sure they don't get worse. Um, so, so, so in academia, you know, we, we always have the running joke, it's like, you know, like, unless you work for Google and you have like a whole like set of GPUs that you can work on, uh, this model won't run in your computer. And I'm just wondering, like, when you're training something like this, as, as someone working at Google, like how, how, like, how many GPUs would you, for example, get access? Because you have to share it with so many, with, with uh, so many people team and you know or on Google uh, like what, what happens 
Well, uh, um, I no longer work at Google. I, I worked at Google until about a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. But back then, uh, it was you basically maybe up to a thousand you can get uh, more than a thousand. You really have to solve some technical problems. Okay. Basically, the GPUs kind of go in the pool, and if it's not reserved, you can take it. And usually, it means there is some intern is taking all of them. Uh, <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> yeah. It, it's kind of loosely uh, poly policed. It's kind of like a big shared pool. Okay. But also a lot of the research advances, they happen on just one GPU. So this is just a single GPU run. Mm -hmm. And this uh, KPAC, the original version, Google is trying to implement it on their machines, but it was made on a single GPU. So I think uh, like having access to all those resources, it makes you a little bit lazy. So it's, uh, there's a saying, by Sergey Brin, scarcity brings clarity. So when people have just one GPU and they have to figure out how to make things work, they, that sort of focuses them to find those new inventions. Uh, so as an example, how Ilya and Alex got into Google. So Jeff Dean came in and he wanted to make this huge neural network that will, uh, that will just uh, learn on YouTube and learn to do everything. And then they competed on ImageNet to recognize categories and they were beaten significantly by this two GPU model made by Alex and Ilya. All right, should we wrap it up? Let's wrap it up.